Hey everybody. Today we're talking about overfitting in machine learning and statistical modeling. I want to demonstrate the phenomenon using R and show why it's a problem specifically, but I'm going to start out with a little bit of general conversation, a couple of slides. So the purpose of statistical inference and machine learning more generally is to draw conclusions about a population, about parameters, from sample data, from statistics. And um, typically we only care about the population, not about the sample. A lot of times the sample is randomly drawn. There's no reason to just care about those few observations. On the other hand, we only have information about the sample, not about the full population. So we build the model, our machine learning or statistical inference model, using the sample data with the goal of applying it to uh, new observations that we don't have in our sample set. Um, the problem there is that the statistical and machine learning models that we build are made to fit the sample data as closely as possible. I mean, why would you build it otherwise to try and fit it uh, poorly? I don't think so. Um, for instance, linear regression is done by ordinary least squares, typically, where you're minimizing the squared residuals. Logistic regression is minimizing deviance. Classification models are trying to often are often trying to optimize the uh, the classification rate and get as many as high a proportion possible correct in the sample data. Unfortunately, models that perform really really well on the data that they're used that are used to train them often do worse when they're predicting results for new data, and that's called overfitting. That's a phenomenon where a model goes too far out of its way to fit the peculiarities of the set used to build it, and, the, and they end up integrating random noise as if that were meaningful information. More flexible models are more susceptible to overfitting, as we'll see in the example I'm about to do. And um, in particular, this means non-parametric models, decision trees are subject to this, for instance. Um, and also black box models. That is ones where um, you just sort of feed the information in and get out a model. And um, if not done carefully, that can lead to overfitting in a lot of cases where you are reflecting peculiarities in your sample data, not actual trends in the population that you're actually trying to get information about. Okay, so let's go back to R and actually see this in practice. I've loaded up Tidyverse as usual and um, Generated some random data. I'll post this script on my GitHub so you can uh, you can download this directly. But so I just generated a thousand observations from a uniform distribution for my x values, going from x equals zero to ten, and then um, made a a y variable using a linear relationship y equals six minus 0.5x with some random noise. So I've generated a thousand random variables with mean zero and standard deviation two. Um, and then I've just visualized that. I've literally plotted everything and put in that exact line with a slope of negative one half and a y intercept of six. So that's coming directly from this. If I were to do a geom smooth with a method equals lm, it would be very close, but not actually identical. The point here is I'm trying to view this as sample data. So, um, here I'm acting kind of omniscient, like I actually have access to all the information about the population from which I'm going to be sampling. Now, in usual machine learning practice, this is not the case. You only have access to a random sample. You're trying to draw conclusions about this population. So um, what I'm going to do here, recognizing that this population data is, uh, is not something we generally have access to, is to actually get a random sample. And so um, these next few lines are getting a random sample of size 25. I've set seeds both for this and my initial randomization so that uh, everything is reproducible. If you were to run this code on your machine, you should get exactly the same results. So um, I think I'll copy and paste this ggplot so that it stays in my script. But the next thing I want to do is to plot that sample data. So um, I'm going to put in another geom point. And the difference is going to be that I have a new data set. And my data set is now called, what did I call it? DF sample right here. Data equals DF sample. And uh, let's make sure that my color is black so that these things look different. OK, so in this random sample, it seems that there's, um, you know, if you kind of squint at this, it seems there's a little bit of a curvy shape. 
you can see uh, almost looks like a parabola. That's just due to random chance. Um, honestly, I played with my seeds a little bit from a random number generator to get something that looked a little bit less linear. And with a sample of size 25, this can happen just by random chance, plenty. So um, let's, uh, let's let R put a smoother on here, just on top of the black points. So GM smooth, and I want data to be that uh, DF sample again. There we go. And let's take out the standard error ribbon just uh, for clarity. I don't need everything cluttered up here. All right, and I want color black on that. I want the color on my smoother to match up with the points that it's modeling. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. There we go. All right, so when you're seeing blue here, you should be thinking about population data. That's typically not stuff we have access to. The blue line being the model that's actually generating the data, generating the values for the, uh, the response variable Y here. And when you see black, you're thinking about the sample data. So that's the random sample of size 25 and um, the low S curve smoother here generated automatically using ggplot. And uh, it's clear that we are not getting a good model for the population data, although it fits the sample data very well. And we can see that visually here. We can also uh, see it by comparison. If instead of fitting a low S curve to this, um, to this sample data, we actually force R and ggplot to fit a regression model. So let's do that. I'll just copy and paste this again. And all I'm going to change is my geome smooth. I'm going to put in a method equals quote lm. And uh, what we'll see when we run this is that the regression line that's put on top of this, the smoother that's put on top of the sample data, is actually a lot closer to the population trend line here. The black line is now much closer to the blue line. Because we've used a less flexible model here, we've actually gotten a better fit for the population data, even though it is a worse fit for the data that was used to train the model. Also notice, by the way here, just a little a note on domain, the um, both the regression line in black here and the low S smoother that I had a minute ago only used a domain for the range of the actual X values, the explanatory values in the set. So over here is the minimum value for X, looks like it's around one, maybe a little less than one. And up here is the biggest one, so R doesn't try and do its, uh, its smoothing outside of that range. In that sense, the, um, the geome ab line that I put on here is actually um, got some extrapolation in it. It's going too far in either direction. If I were to actually use a geome smooth with the method LM on the blue points here, it would cut off at 0 and 10-ish. And that's, uh, that's better behavior. So um, the next thing I want to do here is to actually show how each of these two models are performing on both the training data that we've used to build the model and on the population data. And what we're going to see is that the linear model performs worse on the training data. We've already kind of seen that, but better on the population data. All right, so um, let's start a new section. By the way, that's command shift R for to get a new section label. So let's call this model building. And I'm going to make two models. First, let's get a uh, linear model. And so we're going to do that using LM. Y is explained by X. And the data should be DF sample. And then I'll get model low S. Really just exactly the same way, except now I'm using the low S modeling function. So Y is explained by X. And the data, again, is df sample. OK, great. So um, I can get a summary on each of those to see how they did on the data that's used to train them. So let's do summary of model linear. And uh, we'll do summary of model low s. And I'll adjust my windows so that, or my panes so that you can see all this a little bit better here. Hopefully. OK, so for model linear, I just want to point out the residual standard error of 2.53.
And we interpret this to mean, roughly speaking, that the average actual data point in this data set is about 2.53 units vertically away from that regression line. And if we look at the plot, that's certainly plausible, that these points on average are about 2.53 units away from the black line. That's not fully mathematically exactly correct, but I think it's a good intuition to have, um, as long as you're not like proving theorems or something. All right, so 2.53 for the linear model. Let's see how the low S model does. Here we have um, a somewhat different output. We get some information about how the, uh, the low S model was built, but um, we also get residual standard error here, and now it's 1.887. So that's indicating that the low S model is fitting the sample data more closely. And that's exactly what we saw in the plot and exactly what we saw, what we were expecting. Again, when you have a more flexible model, it tends to fit your sample data more closely. That's kind of the point. All right. So um, the next thing I want to do, oops, <laughs> actually accidentally put in a pipe instead of a new section. Uh, let's do some model evaluation. Now, I'm going to be evaluating these models on population data. In this vid, I actually have access to population data. Of course, in the real world, that's typically not the case. You're building a model specifically because you don't have popu population data. So in a minute, I'm going to say a word about what we should do to evaluate a model when we don't have access to such things. But for the moment, let's actually just see how each of these two models is doing numerically on these two different sets of data. So um, I'm going to make a new set called DF Resid, and what I want to do is I want to take the data set that I started with, the population data, DF, and mutate it. And I want to put in two new columns. I want to have some linear residuals, and I'm going to get some low S residuals. So for every observation in my data set, how far above or below that regression line or low S curve is it? So starting with the linear resid, I want to predict using the model linear. There it is. And I'll readjust my panes so you can see everything. And I want to predict on the original data set. So that's going to give me some predicted values. And then I want to actually subtract off the actual value. So DF dollar Y. Um, actual minus predicted as residuals. I've got this backwards. Learn from my mistakes, friends. OK, actual minus expected. Great. Um, I think I'm just going to copy and paste this, because for the next line, I'm, everything's the same, except instead of linear resid, I want low S resid. And I'll take the actual values, the observed ones, minus the ones that are predicted by the low S model. And let's just take a look at that. If I can type correctly. Always the challenge, a challenge. So for every observation in our data set, x comma y, we get a residual for both the um, linear model and the low s model. Now, you might notice that there's some NAs in here. The What's going on here is that we're seeing x values that are outside the range of the sample data. So 9.44 is up here somewhere on the far right beyond the last point in our sample data set. Now, for a linear model, you get a really simple equation out, y equals mx plus b. And so r is giving you an extrapolated fitted value and then computing a linear or residual from that model. Probably shouldn't take this too seriously, even though it's here. For the low s model, there's no such equation. The low S curve is built specifically by looking at every X value, taking nearby points, weighting them by distance, and fitting a nearby quadratic. That model is used exactly for that one X value. So if you've got values outside the range of the data, the low S model is not, will not give you back any fitted values, won't give you back any fitted residuals. So um, I'm going to drop those. I'm just going to drop all those observations with drop NA. Because they're not, they're not meaningful for my residual calculation. And now if I rerun the view command, you can see I only have 868 observations. Those are the ones that are actually in the range of the sample data. So I think these are the ones where it makes sense to actually evaluate our model. 
Okay, so um, let's get a residual sum of squares for the uh, linear model on this population data. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum of df resid dollar linear resid, and I'll square all that, and then I'll copy and paste that and do the same thing for low s. So low s resid. And then I just want to uh, take a look at both of those. Let's do RSS linear and RSS low s. And I'll uh, adjust my pain a little bit here. OK, so um, what's going on here is we're saying, how is the model performing on the population data? What is the overall sum of squares area of error for the linear model? And what is the overall sum of squares error for the low s model? And in this case, looking at the population data, you can see that the residual sum of squares error for the linear model is not just lower, but much lower. So even though, if you just look at the sample data here, the low S curve is a much better fit, fits the sample data much, much better, when we take into account the possibility of sampling variability, we're getting some overfitting from that low S curve. So the linear model is actually performing better even though it fits the sample data worse. In fact, I could say that a little differently. It's performing better because it's not trying to fit the sample data so specifically. OK, so I said that um, here we had this unrealistic assumption of omniscience on our population data, all these blue dots. In the real world, you don't have all those blue dots. All you have is your sample. All you have is some black dots. So just a couple words as we conclude about what to do in the real world. Since measuring a model's performance, regardless of what metric you're using, on the data that's used to train it is guaranteed to be unreliable, you need some other approach. And the most common and computationally efficient is to use a testing set. And all this means is that before you do any sort of model building, you take your data set, your, the sample data that you actually have, and split it into two pieces. A training set that you'll use to actually build the model and a testing set that you'll use to evaluate the model. Typically what happens is you end up building a couple of models through whatever techniques and then using the testing set to make a final decision between those last couple of models.